Now, I got to get to the word because I'm on a pitch clock and uh, I'm not used to that. So I've got to get to it. All right. So let's get it done. Let's get to it. Covenant of the eighth day is what I want to speak to you about tonight. And our text will be Luke chapter nine, verses one and two. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Thank you to the media team who's done such a great job. Again, it has been such an honor to be here. <clears throat> Praise God. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. I want to talk to you this evening very quickly on the covenant of the eighth day. The covenant of the eighth day. You may be seated tonight. <clears throat> I believe somebody could get the Holy Ghost tonight. I believe somebody could be baptized in the name of Jesus tonight. Amen. I'm just speaking that by faith because that's what I want to say. I want to see a miracle happen in somebody's life tonight. Praise God. This morning I preached to you a little bit about the church. I preach to you about what it means to be a part of the church. Tonight, I want to shift to the second responsibility of believers, and that is as kingdom representatives. So I want to talk to you tonight from the perspective of we are the church this morning, but now tonight we must understand that God has more for us than just to come to church. There were seven days of creation. In day one, God created the light and the darkness. On day two, he created the atmosphere. On day three, he created dry land, seed in the ground, grass in the trees. But I want you to notice this. On the fourth day, God circles back around to address what he did on the first day. He created light and darkness, but there was no heavenly body. So he put a sun and a moon in the sky on the fourth day. He laid the foundation for activity, and then he put responsibility in the sky and said, Sun, you must burn during the day, and moon, you must reflect at night. And he did this so on and so forth. On day five, he created the fish and the birds to fill the atmosphere and the sea and the ocean that he had created on day two. On day six, God made animals and hum humanity to occupy the dry land which he had created on day, on day three. And then... We know that God rested. I want you to notice how God created the foundation first, and then he provided the life and the purpose and the resources to accomplish what he had instructed his creation to do. God will never give us a command or a purpose without the resources to accomplish it. If God calls you to something, he will resource you and enable you and empower you to do it. Don't be afraid if God calls you to an exceptional ministry because God has anointed you exceptionally for that ministry. <laughs> now, creation lasted seven days, but there is an eighth day. Creation took seven days, but on the eighth day. God created Adam with a value that superseded all other aspects of creation. While the plants and the animals had the general purpose of occupying what God had created and multiplying after their kind, God placed a different value system and a stipulation on Adam. After each day, God saw that creation was good. Everybody say good. good. Now say not perfect. Not, perfect. not great. Not it was good. So God created it all to reproduce, but God left something undone. God made it good. If you're talking about a perfect God, why would it only be good? Why would there only be a good creation, a good way to end the day? He saw it, and it was good, but it wasn't great. It wasn't perfected. It wasn't finished. And creation, what God was saying is, I'm leaving it undone on purpose because I need someone to manage and steward it. There is a principle here from the very outset of creation. God provides the resources, but He created you and I. He created humanity for partnership. Genesis 2.15, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress, which means to work or to serve in the garden, and to keep it, which means to guard, observe, or protect it. 
God created the garden, but instructed man to steward it and to make sure it was reproducing and also to make sure nothing was getting in that didn't need to be getting in and nothing getting out that didn't need to be getting out. God invited Adam into a partnership. God expects stewardship, reproduction, vigilance to guard what he has given us. Now, on the eighth day, the partnership with Adam and God began. Genesis 17, 7 through 14, we see that God establishes the covenant with Abraham by the act of circumcision of every male that is born into his house. Now, it's interesting because this was also to be done on the eighth day. The reason why is that the number eight in the Bible represents a new beginning. It represents a new order or a new creation. God created the world in seven days, but on the eighth day, it was humanity's beginning of responsibility. It was the beginning of purpose for humanity. The Garden of Eden, Eden does not mean paradise. It means pleasure. God said in pleasure, you're going to have to get busy and you're going to have to work and you're going to have to partner with me to take the resources that I have given you and therefore living for God is a pleasure. Genesis 17, 10 through 14, the divining mark of separation between Abraham and the rest of the world was for every male to be circumcised on the eighth day. And so this new beginning, it was started by God. God doesn't want subjects. He wants partners. God is not interested in puppets. He wants sons and daughters to join him in the family business. God is calling us out of the world of sin and darkness and into divine partnership. Just as God gave Adam dominion over the earth, the fowls of the air, and everything that breathes, slithers or walks. When we obeyed John 3, 1 through 8, and Acts 2, 38, we were given authority and dominion and power in the name of Jesus. We took on the name of the Father, and we took on the Spirit of the Father, and He said, you are not subject unto the, unto the enemy. Now you have dominion over the enemy. I am partnering with you, and I am telling you to go and teach all nations and baptize them he said but I will give you power to be a witness I am going to tell you to go but I'm going to give you the resources I'm going to give you the purpose and the plan but I am going to give you the power and the ability to do what I ask you to do turn to your neighbor and say you're a partner with God turn back around to the one you just ignored and they think you don't like them and say you are a partner with the father Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, Jesus gives power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. I want you to understand this is a simple thing, and I know you've heard it before, but we're not fighting for victory or for a position of victory. We're fighting from a position of victory. You see, the principle of divine partnership is evident in the teaching of Jesus when he said in the parable of the talents, Matthew chapter 25, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants together and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five, unto another he gave two, unto another he gave one, to every man according to his several ability. He gave talents according to the ability, but the talents did not come from the servant, they came from the master. The principle is that the resources are His. The calling is His. The anointing is His. The power is His. The purpose is His. The message is His. What He's looking for is some hands. And what He's looking for is some feet. And what He's looking for is a yes in your spirit that says, God, you can use me to partner with you to make a change in the world. Oh, praise God. 
I want to tell you today with no uncertain terms that God has chosen you to partner with him. God has chosen Eastgate to partner with him. God has chosen you as individuals in the body to partner with him. God did not call you into this place just so that you can come to the house of God and enjoy the benefits of the five loaves and two fishes. What God wants you to do is understand, I brought you out so that I can bring you in. And when I bring you in, I am going to give you walled cities that you did not that you did not build. I'm going to give you houses that you did not construct. I am going to give you vineyards that you did not plant. But I am the one who's going to give it to you if you will say yes. When God gives you your talents, and oh yeah, you all have one. You might be like me, and this is not false humility, brother. This is true. You might be like me and have one talent, or you might be like Pastor Tuttle and have about 75 talents. It doesn't really matter. I'm not in competition with my brother. God called me to just take my talent and give it to him. I don't need 75. I just need one. And if God gave me one, then he wants to use it. He wants to partner with you. It doesn't matter if you feel insignificant. It doesn't matter if you feel like you don't have a place. God said, I got one thing in you. I've got a blessing in you. I've got power in you. I've got a witness in you. And I need you to say yes to the family business. God didn't intend for us to bury our talents in the earth. Let me explain to you what happens when you bury something in the earth. When you bury something in the earth, a natural object, you bury a piece of wood, or maybe you're going to drive a pole into the ground and build a fence, that pole eventually, no matter if it's treated lumber, it's going to rot because the earth always corrupts. The earth always rots. It always decays. But can I tell you something that God did for you when you received the Holy Ghost? He put the Spirit of God in you that is not corruptible. He put the Spirit of God in you that's greater than any metal or gem or substance on earth, and it does not corrupt. That's why he said where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You've got to understand that thieves can't steal what God put in you. The enemy can't take what God put in you. You must understand. He is saying, I gave you what you need to partner with me. He gives us the plan and he shows us in the word the best way to use what he's given us but he gives us the freedom to misuse what he's given us. God gives us our bodies, but he doesn't interfere with how many Twinkies we eat. Oh, he sends Sister Jenny Craig... And he sends the hitman high intensity interval training. And he sends weight watchers. But he doesn't tell you how many Dr. Peppers to. Oh, I'm about to lose y'all. See, he tells us in his word that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Our bodies and our spirit are his. Oh, I could get lost right now talking about our mind, which is our soulish nature. That's where the choice is made. Our body and our soul are his, but our choices are not. You see, God wants us to understand that in divine partnership, you make choices that are kingdom-oriented, not flesh-oriented. The reason so many of us can't stay out of trouble is because we haven't understood that the mind of Christ must be in us where we humble ourselves and we become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Because it's when we do that that God exalts us to a heavenly position as sons and daughters of God. We cannot be carnal and expect God to use us, but we can be spiritual and expect God to do mighty exploits through us. The reason most churches don't want to live, they don't want to live right is because there's always sacrifice involved in partnership. I have to 
sacrifice my will to take up his cross. I have to sacrifice me in order to follow him. I can't be me. I've got to be like him. And can I tell you that whenever you're like him, there's so much more life that's better and better and better and it's greater and it's more exciting. There's so many more benefits to living. He daily loadeth us with benefits. Oh God. What are so in Matthew 16, 18 through 19, Jesus expresses to Peter. He said this, and I want to get to the crux of the message quickly. My pitch clock is running short, and I'm about to get a strike called on me. <laughs> Jesus expressed to Peter this, image, this message, and it's to us all. He said, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, a little stone, and upon this rock, a massive rock, he was talking about himself. You're the little guy. You're just a chip off the old block. I'm the mountain here. And he said, he said I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, I want you to notice what Jesus is doing here. He's, he's getting Peter to begin to pay attention to the kingdom. He, he's, he's introducing kingdom concepts. I will build my church. We talked about that this morning, the church. But then he starts saying, the gates of hell are not going to prevail against the church. And I will give thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. See, there is a transition that we all must take when we leave here from Sunday church. We have to transition, I feel the Holy Ghost, that we have to transition from being fed as the church to give as the kingdom. Mm. He said, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, the concept of binding and loosing is in connection to bringing to earth that which is in heaven. Let your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. It's already, it's already defined. It's already established. It's already settled. The word has already gone forth. Where we come in as partners with God is that we take heaven's purpose and we display it through our actions on earth. So the concept of binding and loosing is whatever you tie down or lock down on the earth is going to be locked down in heaven. You lock down your worship, some things are going to be locked down in your life. You start locking down where you're not praying like you should and you're locking God out. God says, I'll stand at the door and knock, but I'm not coming in to dine with you until you make the choice to open that door up and let me walk in and you become a partner with me again. You see, what we have to ask ourselves as apostolics, what are we reproducing in our life that God gave us? Are we binding the move of God in our life and His kingdom being evidenced in our life by burying our talents and resources and gifts from God in an earthly sinful mind, mind frame? Or have you loosed the purpose of God to operate through your daily interactions the way He wants? Are you making a kingdom difference in your world or is the world making a difference in you? Jesus told us to pray in Matthew 6, 9 through 10, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in the earth as it is in heaven. God is looking for partners. And this is what I wanted to get to and I'm going to have to hurry because I want, I want the Lord to speak what I have been feeling for this congregation. John eleven thirty eight 38 through 44 tells the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. Jesus performed the miraculous of raising Lazarus from the dead, and we know the story well. But there were two things that he did, or let me say it this way, there were two things that Jesus did not do. There was one thing that he did, but there were two things that he did not do. The scripture tells us that Jesus comes to the tomb and he says, someone roll away the stone. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. 
Jesus was pre prepared to do the miraculous. He was there to perform the miraculous. Jesus, don't you know Lazarus is dead? When the word came to him, he said, oh no, this is for your sakes. I'm glad that he's dead. That you can know that the power of God is present. He was there to do a miracle. But before he did the miracle, he said, I need somebody to partner with me to get the stone out of the way from the dead guy. In other words, hey, somebody at Eastgate, I need an audience with the dead guy and I need somebody to recognize that a Bible study needs to be taught. I need somebody to recognize that a testimony needs to be told. I need somebody to realize I have targeted that dude right there and I'm ready to have an interaction with him, but I need somebody to move the stone so that the light can shine to him for the first time. Your pastor today, this afternoon, taught two Bible studies. You know what he was doing? He was rolling away the stone from somebody's eyes. Oh, you hear what I'm saying in the Holy Ghost? The Lord, the Lord was using your pastor as a stone roller. We don't need rolling stones in the church. We need stone rollers in the church. You see... You've got to understand that when we talk about souls and we talk about revival, I'm talking, I'm talking about kingdom right now. When we start talking about souls and revival, there has to be a partnership with God where somebody says, hey, I see the need, pastor. There's people who don't know Jesus. There's people who don't know the kingdom values. There's people who are broken by sin and they're decaying and rotting in a tomb. I've got to show them the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. I've got to be the light to them. I've got to be the sound, the sound of the word to them. I've got to be the hands of Jesus to them. I've got to get them into an audience with Jesus. I'm telling you, all of you who teach Sunday school, all of you who teach Bible studies, all of you who did outreach today, you're a stone roller. You're getting the stone out of the way. Don't be discouraged whenever you don't have anybody come to Jesus. It's not up to you to save them. It's just up to you to roll away the stone. It's up to Jesus to do the work of salvation. It's up to him to save them. It's up to him to wash away their sins. It's up to him to fill them with the Holy Ghost. It's just up to us to show them. Don't stop doing what you're doing, Eastgate. Don't stop doing what you're doing. Don't stop outreach. Don't stop believing. Don't stop being a testimony. Don't stop teaching Bible studies. Don't stop with your worship because you're showing the light of Jesus. Woo Someone had to go roll away the stone. Woo See, Jesus didn't do that. Peter, I want you to go tell somebody named Cornelius. I'm going to partner with you. I, why doesn't Jesus just save everybody? It's because he has chosen to partner with us. He has chosen to use us and to say, I have a reason for you to be in this church. I have a reason for you to be here. I have a reason to bless you on Sunday. It's because that which I have freely given you on Sunday, go pour it out on Monday. When you go to school, remember God put you there. I don't want you to ever think that you just moved into a random neighborhood. I want you to understand that God chose your neighborhood. I don't want you to think you just go to work tomorrow God chose your work he told you where to work and you didn't even know it because he needed someone to roll away the stone so that he could bless so that he could save and reveal himself to them you think that boss that's giving you a hard time is just demonic. Well, they're just of the devil. Have you ever thought maybe they're broken? Maybe they're bruised? Maybe they're in a grave? Maybe they've been in a tomb of darkness and maybe they go home and they're in an abusive situation and they're taking it out on you. But you, oh kingdom representative, you as a child of God, you were put there to be a partner. Pastor, pray for me a new job. I can't stay on my boss. Why don't you go and be a stone roller away? Why don't you worship when you get to work? 
Why don't you plead the blood of Jesus over your mind and over your spirit that it doesn't become carnal and you understand the value of kingdom representation when you're on the... Hey! I'm apologizing to my family because I don't mean it towards them. Love y'all. This isn't to y'all. God, why did you put me in a family of lunatics? Oh, I felt the witness right there. Somebody, hmm. Oh, yeah, I felt, I felt the witness right there. Somebody, somebody's praying that, my God, I got to hurry. <laughs> it's because God said, I need somebody to roll a stone. <laughs> out of the way of your crazy family now I want you to notice I'm going to hurry but I want you to notice quickly we can't all be smart as smart as Caleb so let's catch on quick stones rolled away Jesus speaks, the word and the power bring forth. And there was a second thing that Jesus would not do. The man comes out, the Bible says he was bound, hand and foot, and the cloth was about his face. Jesus said, someone Loose him and let him go. Now, this is where I want to talk to the church. God may be ready to awaken those who are dead in their sins and may be ready to deliver those that are bound in their prison cells of sin, but he's depending on someone to partner with him to roll away the stone. However, Somebody has to get their hands dirty on the other side of salvation. Mm. I want you to notice this. He that was dead came out of the grave. Martha had it right when she said, Lord, by now he stinketh. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Jesus raised him from the dead after someone had, shy, had shown the light. But on the backside of that, there was a dude that had been dead four days. Surely by now, he stinks. Now, I'm not trying to be disgusting or graphic. My God, I have got to hurry. I have seen, I was on a police patrol one time, and there, there was a call. Please forgive me if you have a weak stomach. There was a call uh, that this man had not been seen in a week. It was in the desert communities of California. This man had not been seen in a week, and there was a funny smell coming from the house. We break in the door, and the, the man that I was with, the deputy that I was with, he said, hey, before you go in, do you have a weak stomach? I'm like, well, I don't know till I go see what you're talking about me seeing. If I do, well, then there's going to be a cleanup on aisle three, all right? <laughs> so I walk in. I won't describe everything I saw, but the man had been dead for a week. The one thing that, it's very disturbing. I don't want to be disgusting, but I've just got to tell you, a decomposing body is not pretty. There was a, a, a sore, a cut that he, had, that he had received on his arm the week before he died. The body, the way that it works is when it dies, that any, any broken parts in your skin, the body begins to decompose through that broken part. And so on this arm was a bandage, and all I can explain was all over the floor was a red goo. I, I, I hope you don't like Cairo corn syrup, but that's what it looked like, just dyed red. The stench was absolutely horrific. It was worse than any dead animal, dead skunk even, that I have ever smelled in my life. It was horrible. 
I couldn't get the smell off them out of my clothes. I couldn't get the smell off of my shoes. I couldn't get the smell out of my nostrils. I couldn't. I, could, I, I took three baths that night because I couldn't get. The, let me just tell you, decomposing flesh is nasty. Jesus healed Lazarus from the dead, but the goo of death was still in the rags. The closer you got to him, the worse he smelled. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And everybody shouted. But then Jesus said, hey, loose him. Lord, I, I feel the spirit of sacrifice. I'm just going to go lay on the ground. I'm not going to shout, oh, God. I just, Lord, I feel, I, is that my mama calling? My wife, I think my wife just called. I, I can't be around for the stinky part. Because the closer you get to somebody who's been delivered from the grave, the nastier their sin stay. let me tell you something I, I feel in the Holy Ghost right now if this is alright I feel a word for this church and this is why I came I, I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost that God is getting ready to open some things up for this church God is getting ready to do I'm not speaking in a false prophecy I'm telling you in the name of Jesus I have felt it you're on the I-10 corridor and there is prophecy on the I-10 corridor there is something that is going to happen right here at Eastgate but I want to let you know that it's about to get stinky and dirty and nasty you're going to have to deal with things that you never thought you would have to deal with because people are going to come in here and receive the Holy Ghost and Jesus is saying who will loose them <laughs> Lazarus had a napkin on his face he couldn't breathe I, I am so hurt by how many times we have allowed hurting people who are saved to suffocate because we were too afraid to get dirty can I tell you that when Jesus talked to Peter and he said Peter do not call unclean what I have called clean Can I remind you that the church can get your hands dirty, but it doesn't mean your heart's going to get dirty. If you stay connected to Jesus, the woman with the issue of blood came and touched the hem of his garment, and by the law, Jesus should have been unclean. That officially made him unclean. But the reverse happened. When she touched him, he did not become unclean. She became clean. You have to understand that the prayer we're doing around here and the worship we're doing around here and the powerful church we're doing around here, he's making you clean. When you wake up in the morning and you go to your knees in prayer and you get in the word and you read and you exhibit the fruit of the spirit, God is making you clean. You will not become polluted if you stay connected to Jesus. Loose him and let him go. But you don't understand, Lord. This dude stinks. This lady stinks. I don't want my kids around their kids. But you don't understand. Somebody taught him a Bible study. I spoke the word of life. And I resurrected them from the dead. Why is there nobody that will loose? You see, the more you unravel them, it's layered. It's layered. It's layers of stench. And I have noticed in my life that the closer I get, to seeing a person truly healed and made whole, the stinkier things come out of their life. 
Because, see, they'll show you some things on the surface. They'll be like, oh, I have this testimony, Pastor. Oh, God, delivered me and saved me. But behind closed doors, they still suffer from the abuse. They still hurt when nobody sees them. That's why, listen, I feel, I, feel, I, feel in the, I feel in the vein of the Holy Ghost right now to tell you something. See, that's why some people get aggressive whenever, whenever they, they think, they think that you're saying something about them. You're not, but they think you are. They think that you, because there's mind, there's mind constraints of prison in, the, in their past. There's, there's mind constraints of abuse and, and they bring their old life, their grave life into the new life and it, that's when the Lord is saying, I need, I need a Holy Ghost filled partner to unloose them. I need somebody to unloose them. I need somebody to unravel them. I need somebody to loose them from their grave clothes. Oh, we talked about get up out of that grave, but I want to tell you, there's some folks who don't know how to get out of the grave. See, Jesus came to set the captive free, but all he does is open the stone, open the door, but you have to come out. I didn't think I was going to say this, but I won't, let me just hit it hard. I got, my God, I've got five seconds. That thing is messing me up. See, here's the problem. We think that the power of God should do all the work. God should do it. Oh God, you got to fix them. Why, why aren't they? Why aren't they dressed up in three weeks? And I, I feel I felt this in the Holy Ghost a little while ago. I felt I felt very strongly to tell somebody this. Just because the limelight is on the Bible study teachers and on the soul winners. The rest of us think that there is no purpose for us. Some of you run very deep. I felt this in the Holy Ghost. Some of you run very deep and you have questioned how I'm shy. I run deep. How can I teach a Bible study? How can I be the stone roller away? God doesn't call everybody to the same ministry. Let me tell you why God gave you your gifting and your personality. It's because you can walk over to somebody who's broken and you can put your arm around them because you know what it feels like to love deep. You know what it feels like when you love mm, you love deep and people hurt you. You know what that feels like. And this person coming in, they don't know anything. All they know is I was lost, but now I'm found. And they don't understand all the culture of Pentecost. And, and they don't understand even how to dance. I've seen, Brother Tuttle was telling me some dude did the worm up here. I think it was you, Caleb. My God, this dude's not just smart, but he's talented. I've seen guys break dance. I saw a dude backflip off the platform. I saw a guy yell as loud as he could, Jesus, man, thank you. They don't know how to act, but those of you who have been few, through a few things, those of you who have fought a few battles, those of you who have been through some battles and you've come out on the other side, those of you who may not have the talent to be a stone roller away, but you've got the talent to love. You've got the capacity to have mercy. You've got the capacity to show them how to dance in their storm. You've got the capacity to say, hey, I may not be down there dancing with the crazies, but I can love you like nobody else. You know why? I'm about to get in trouble. I'm sorry. Please, I mean this. I mean this. I'm about to get in trouble. You know why psychology and psychiatry is such a massive deal in the church today? It's because the bride has forgotten how to unwrap with love. Mm. The bride has to return to partnership.
There is a harvest that is coming. The, ter the turmoil and the tumult of the world, it's all by design. Yes, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit of the Antichrist, but it, God, God is not surprised, and it's not God losing the battle, folks. Mm. You hear me today, we're not fighting for victory in America. We're fighting from a position of victory. None of this is without design by the Creator. Can I tell you, the world doesn't need any more judgment. I am, you, you know, please, I hope you know my heart. Stand on holiness. Stand on righteousness. You, I, hey, if you, if you think I'm talking about compromise, love does not equal compromise. Let me tell you something. Love means you tighten up more. You get tighter. You get stronger. You get more holy because you love. I need an ex-drug dealer right now, up here. Ex-drug dealer, ex-drug dude. You, come on, you look like an ex-drug dealer. Come on up here, man. I used to do that. Let me tell you something. I'm free of it now. Yeah. You hear that? Hallelujah, hallelujah free of everything. And, and you know what? I, I want you to notice something. He's down here with a bunch of dudes and ladies worshiping God because somebody had helped him. You see, the thing about it is, is that when God calls you out of the grave, yeah, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here without somebody rolling away the stone, without the word of God, or without somebody loving you. Let me tell you something. When you can love somebody who is unlovable, when you can love somebody who doesn't deserve it, when you can love somebody who stinks, then you know that the love of God is in you. And you know that God is using you. And you know that God will send you a harvest because he trusts you to roll away the stone and to loose the grave clothes. Some of you... I'm coming, I'm done. Some of you, some of you, some of you have gotten lost. Because you think ministry is only one thing. God is wanting to recalibrate you tonight. He's wanting to bring your focus back and to tell you that your quiet personality Your reserved personality. What you thought was fear. What you thought was, I'm just shy. It was God saying, no, I need someone who knows how to love deep and who knows how to unwrap the grave clothes of those that are coming. Can I tell you that the revival God is sending, and you know it because this is a revival church, but the revival that's here the harvest that's here. It's going to take people who will be willing to move the stone. And it's going to take people who are willing to get their hands dirty in the harvest. Don't be afraid to get the stench of death on you when you're loving someone to Jesus. Don't be afraid of what other people say. Don't be afraid of what other churches say. Don't be afraid of what other ministries say. Don't be afraid.
Let's just lift up the name of Jesus tonight, and let's just say, Lord, if you can use anything, you can use me. Come on, let's cry out tonight to be used of God. Lord, whatever you want me to do, whatever it is, God, whatever you have given me, whatever talent, I give it to you, God, so that you, you can receive glory from my life. You can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. You can use anything, Lord, you can use me. You can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Come on, find somebody, lay your hand on them. You, you can, can use, use that's it. Lord, you can use me. Begin to unravel. I don't know what it is, but Lord, I, I want to be hand, used Lord, by you. Take my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. You can use 